This is the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought, him, brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was being seen, said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. And at that moment she came and she began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. There the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. For the past few months, we have been hearing Christmas music in stores. For months, we have been buying presents and booking flights and scheduling holiday parties and looking forward to seeing loved ones. For months, we have been thinking and planning and stressing and hoping. And now, it's over. Our savior was born right on schedule, December 25th, and now the world is moving on. Actually, it only took two days for my mother to bring up boxes from the basement so we can put away all the Christmas ornaments. If you look up and down the street this week, you're going to see people unwinding their lights putting away their decorations, tucking their dying trees at the curb, because for the world, Christmas is over. But in church, we are right in the middle of it. I mean, look around. We still have candles. We still are surrounded by these beautiful poinsettias. There is the baby Jesus in the manger. We have gathered today in the middle of a season called Christmas. We have everything. We are still celebrating. But it's harder to celebrate now. It's harder than it was last week. Last week, if you were here, there were a thousand candles, and there was champagne and a huge crowd to celebrate with. And this week, no champagne. No big crowd. 
People are tired. Some people are snowed in. Some people are still very far from home. This season of Christmas is a very tender time for our church and a very tender time for our people. Indeed, on this day of the liturgical year, on this day of our congregational life, the cost of gift giving has been more than some people can bear. Pastor Shelley Copeland wrote, some families entered into this sacred season with great expectations, only to discover it was not what they thought it was. Therefore, this season of Christmas is the time beyond our means, beyond our expectations. What is true for us now was true for Mary and Joseph back then. Luke tells us that the Holy Family has been very busy. At the beginning of Mary's pregnancy, they journeyed from where they lived in Nazareth to Jerusalem to meet Elizabeth. Then they went back to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, and then they carried their newborn baby back to Nazareth, where they stayed at home so Mary could heal. I think it's safe to say that Mary and Joseph were physically and emotionally exhausted. They probably felt like they had nothing left to give. Yes, sure, that's a really cute manger scene with all the shepherds and stuff. But then they went back home. There was no big crowd to greet them. Just long days with a newborn and very short nights where they got no sleep at all. They were new parents looking down at their baby who was named by an angel and called the anointed one of God, and yet he behaved like any other baby. He was tiny and fragile, and he was hungry, and he got sick, and he got cold. I wonder how many nights baby Jesus screamed with colic. I wonder if anyone brought them the Palestinian version of a casserole. I wondered if Mary worried that he would die young, as many babies did in those days. In our story today, the English translation says child, but that's not true. Baby Jesus was 40 days old in this story. He's still a newborn. He can't hold up his head. He can't focus his eyes. He can't open his hands. They're clenched in little fists. But officially, for their faith, it was time to go. So Mary and Joseph left home yet again to take Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem and present him to God in fulfillment of the law of Moses. Now Luke tells us that Mary and Joseph brought with them a sacrificial offering to be presented to a priest at the temple of the Lord. And the law of Moses that they were following, if you were wondering, is in Leviticus chapter 12. And then the law says that when a baby is presented, the parents are to offer a young lamb and a dove to the priest, who will then sacrifice it and present it to God. But Mary and Joseph could not afford a lamb and a dove. Luke tells us that they brought along two pigeons. This was the sacrifice appointed to people who were living in destitute poverty. God's only son, the king of the world, born to human parents who couldn't afford the social and financial obligation of their religion. Mary and Joseph faced a painful reality that many poor people of faith face today. The, the reality that full participation in temple life, full participation in church life, requires an expenditure of resources, of money and time and energy that you don't always have to spare. There's nothing wrong with you. That's the thing that's wrong with the world. But somehow, Mary and Joseph made the journey. Somehow they found a few copper coins to buy pigeons to be sacrificed. And then something strange happens when they finally arrive at the temple. This was, this was quite a long journey for two young parents. As they walked in through the door, you can imagine that they were feeling anxious, that they wanted to just spend their money, spend their pigeons, and get out of there. But 
then they ran into someone. Luke tells us that Simeon, a devout man of God who spent much of his time in the temple, had been told that he would not die until he saw with his own eyes the Messiah. And when he saw these two young parents walking in, holding their baby, holding two pigeons in a cage, he would have known two things. One, that they were parents coming to consecrate their baby to God. And two, that they were extremely poor. Yet Simeon can hardly wait until they get in. It actually says that before even Mary and Joseph had crossed the threshold of the temple, Simeon runs over and interrupts them. He keeps them from walking by and finding a priest. He snatches the newborn Jesus out of Mary's arms and he says, my God, I have seen your salvation with my own eyes. Our English translation says that Mary and Joseph were amazed by this, but the Greek word that is used actually means bewildered. They were confused. What is going on? Who is this person? We have come here to do something specific, and this person has interrupted us to tell us about the blessing we're carrying. And then the prophet Anna comes over and does the same thing, lest you think that Simeon was a one-off. The prophet Anna comes over and she coos over the baby and she's telling everyone that this child right here, this baby is the Messiah of the Lord. This is the one who will redeem Israel. You can imagine the worry that must have come over Mary and Joseph as suddenly everyone in the temple was watching them. Suddenly everyone was watching these teenage parents from Nazareth, these poor parents, judging them maybe, wondering about their future. Everyone was watching this baby who Simeon said in the presence of everyone that he was destined for the falling and rising of many. What will happen next? You might think that at this time a group of Roman soldiers would come in and quickly kill the baby Jesus or maybe the, the priest would say, get out of here. But that's not what happens. There's something so profound about this moment because God could have come to earth as a fully formed man. God could have just shown up, riding a war horse maybe, holding a gleaming sword, ready to vanquish the Romans. Or he could have come like a king, wearing a crown dressed in jewels. But instead, the first time that the Lord Almighty came to Jerusalem was as a newborn baby, 40 days old, tiny and powerless. He was the Messiah, but not the one that they were waiting for. Not the one who was going to crush the Romans. God arrived powerless in his mother's arms. But there was sort of a power there, a different kind of power than we think. You know the way that we talk to babies, that sort of sing-songy voice, the soft tone, the careful body language? Studies have shown that people from all cultures do this. This phenomenon exists across all known languages. It's a physiological reaction. It's hardwired into who we are. Humans instinctively treat infants with tenderness and care. And as a biologist by training, I can tell you that this is not a given in the animal world. There are many species that don't do this. In fact, it would be an evolutionary advantage for us to not do this. But we humans, when, when a baby is born into our family, or when a baby is brought into our church, we, we wonder how we can help how we can be part of their experience in the world, how we might change our postures and our voices and our expressions and our words in order to keep this precious, tiny little thing 
safe, comfortable, and happy. It is human nature for us to assume a posture of gentleness around infants, and what a wonderful way for God to reveal God's self to the people. Not with a show of power, but as an infant to nurture tenderness in us. Dear people, this season of Christmas that we find ourselves in now is a season for dwelling in the joy of God's presence and the hope of God's salvation. And that doesn't mean that you can't be sad or afraid or worried or empty. But it does mean, just for now, just now, take your worries and set them on the ground next to you. There will be a time for picking them up. But now is the time to set your heart on the infant Jesus instead. Now is the time for soft words, for gentleness, for tenderness, and for hope. Please pray with me. These are words from Jan Richardson. So may we know the hope that is not just for someday, but for this day, here, now, in this moment that opens to us. Hope not made of wishes, but of substance. Hope made of sinew and muscle and bone. Hope that has breath and a beating heart. Hope that will not keep quiet and be polite. Hope that knows how to holler when it's called for. Hope that knows how to sing when there seems to be a little cause. Hope that raises us from the dead. Not someday, but this day, every day, again and again and again.